Church, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10 through 20 again, and we'll be reading it each week in this series on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. May God bless the reading of his word in the minds and hearts of his people every time we hear it. You please join me in prayer. God, we open our minds and hearts to you again, here and now for the searching and ministry, the convicting and comforting of your Holy Spirit. Whatever it is that you need to do in our lives, come Holy Spirit, do your ministry, do your work. Help us hear the truth, believe the truth, live on the truth, live out the truth. And help us, Lord, to give honor and glory to Jesus in all things. Come Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, the sheet is in the worship folder that uh, has the outline of the message and a place to fill in blanks and take notes. And uh, the words that go in the blanks on the sheet will be on the screens throughout the message. Please take it out and follow along if it helps. So this morning, instead of an opening joke, I've got a, a little opening um, instruction set of how to bathe a cat. And I think you will find it very interesting this morning. Step one, thoroughly clean the toilet. Now you can see already this is going to a bad place. Number two. Lift both lids and add shampoo. Step three, find and soothe cat as you carry him or her to the bathroom. Step four, in one swift move, place cat in toilet, close both lids and sit on top of it so cat cannot escape. Cat will self-agitate, <laughs> producing ample suds. Ignore the ruckus coming from inside the toilet. Cat is enjoying this. Step six, flush toilet three or four times. This provides a power rinse, which is quite effective. <laughs> Step seven, have someone else open the outside door, stand as far from the toilet as possible, then quickly lift both lids. Step eight, clean cat will rock it out of the toilet and outdoors where your now clean pet will air dry. Sincerely, the dog. So you just knew it was coming to a bad place. You know, it's very traditional that cats and dogs hate each other, that there's no peace between cats and dogs. Raise your hand if you have both a cat and a dog at home and they get along just fine, thank you very much. There are several of us that do. But the old tradition is that cats and dogs don't get along. This morning, the message is about peace. It's about the peace of the shoes of the gospel. Uh, we're in week three of our series on the armor of God. We looked first at the belt of truth and then at the breastplate of righteousness this week. Now, the shoes of the gospel of peace. Armor means battle. We are armed for battle. And, and Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor. The word in the Greek there is panoply. And it means put on all the armor, the entire suit of armor. The, the panoply is all of the pieces. 
None is optional. None is more important than any other. All are needed so that we will be defended and covered in the battle. Imagine a soldier who does not put on the helmet and goes into battle and an arrow comes and shoots the soldier in the head. The soldier cannot claim, that shouldn't have happened. I didn't have my helmet on, but I had my shield. Come on. No. All the armor is important. All the armor is necessary. Each piece has its purpose. And we are urged to put on the whole armor of God. It's not either or. It's not either the belt of truth or the the breastplate of righteousness. It's not either the shoes of peace or the shield of faith. Put it all on. That you may stand against the devil's schemes. The devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Satan schemes. Satan uses cunning more than a direct attack, more than raw power. Satan ambushes soldiers walking through the woods. They're an easy target for an ambush. So, dear friends, we put on the armor of God, and and we ought to be intentional about protecting the openings of our lives. Openings like what we see what we look at, openings like what we hear and fill our minds with, openings like our habits that can open us up to the influence of the enemy or open us up to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the things we see, the things we take in, the things we do in our lives can be openings for the Holy Spirit or openings for the enemy. I remember a Bible school song that we used to sing when I was in Bible school a long, long, long time ago. And I don't remember that we have sung this particular song in Bible school since I've been here at this church. We may have once, but I don't remember that we have. But the the song goes like this. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down with love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And then be careful little ears what you hear and be careful little mouth what you say because those are openings. And, and Satan will come through them. They, Satan will come through the stuff we put in our brains, through our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our habits and pester us and, 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 and make sneak attacks on us. Dear friends, it's guerrilla warfare. It's often not an outright, straight up, front to, face-to-face confrontation. So, Paul says, let your feet be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Let your feet be fitted. So, Paul undoubtedly had in mind a Roman soldier and the Roman soldier's arm, armor. And the Roman shoes, the Roman combat boots, if you will, were hob-soled sandals. Sandals with little metal spikes coming out of them, not sharp spikes, though rounded spikes, which were meant to give grip in the ground so that the the soldier could stand against the onslaught of the enemy because a lot of battle in Roman days was hand-to-hand. It was not a distance. It was up close, hand-to-hand, strength against strength. And so a soldier needed a strong set of shoes and a strong foundation to keep from being pushed back because a soldier lying on his back can't fight in the battle. Soldier that slips is useless. Hob-nold, hob-soled sandals. Sort of like golf spikes, if you will. Um, Maybe you could say football cleats, but football cleats tend to have bigger spikes than these little ones that you see in the picture on the screen. Now, the, the Roman combat boots, if you will, also included the greaves. And the greaves were the shin guards that you see in the other picture. And so the, the lower, the feet, ankles, and lower leg are all protected by the shoes of the, the sandals and the greaves. And again, that's because a sword blow, um, even, even uh, the, uh, a blow by the wrong end of a spear, not the pointed end, but the wooden end of the spear, that takes out a soldier's legs, puts him on his back, then he's defenseless. 
Soldiers cannot fight lying on their backs. If the legs are taken out, if he slips and falls, it's a disaster. And so we are called to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace and stand firm and not be moved. We're called to stand firm. And we're called to stand firm on a foundation. What is our foundation? The gospel of peace. Gospel is a simple truth. The word gospel in Greek simply means good news. It is the good news about what Jesus did for us that is the foundation on which we stand, the foundation in which we put our faith and the foundation, foundation on which we stand. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4 says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There's the gospel. There's the crux of the gospel. The one who died on a hill called Calvary on a Roman cross was not just Jesus, a rabbi from Nazareth. He was Christ. Christ is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah, Messiah. He is the very anointed one of God. He is the son of God, God in the flesh. And so his death on the cross means something more than any other criminal who died on any other Roman cross. Because as son of God, he could could put death to death. He could put sin to death on the cross on our behalf and pay the price for our sin. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, every single one of us. All of us disobey God. All of us, at times and in ways, live for ourselves instead of living for God. And the the scripture says the wages of sin is death. We bring death into our lives when we do that, when we live that way. And so we deserve to die, but Jesus died in our place so that we could be forgiven of our sin. Why would he do this? He does it. Jesus himself says he does it because God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, Jesus told Nicodemus. God created human beings in his own image. God made us for relationship. God made us for love. God made us not just for love with one another. God made us for love for him and to receive his love for us. He made us in his image. And so even when Adam and Eve sinned and sin came into the world and death came into the world, even when men and women then began to live by evil decisions, by selfishness, even when the sin nature comes into us and all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God, God says, you are made in the image of God. You are my glorious creation and you are worth redeeming because I love you. And so God didn't just sit back and watch us all go to hell. God did something about it. He sent his son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sin and was raised from the dead to break death's grip on us so that we could be raised from the dead, so that we could live forever. But he didn't just do that. He ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit into the world, sent the Holy Spirit upon the church, sends the Holy Spirit to live in the heart of every person who puts our faith in Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can work in us the holy love of God in a way that frees us to be able to live the way God wants us to live and to honor him with our lives. It frees us from our own fallen, broken sin nature and gives us the freedom to obey God to love him well, to love others, to serve, to give, out of love. It's the holy love of God that does this. It's the holy love of God shed into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who comes and takes up residence in us 
when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. God did this, and this is the gospel. This is the foundation on which we take our stand. And dear friends, we are saved by grace through faith. This is the number one thing that the world has wrong today. Every other religion has wrong today. Many people who say they are Christians have wrong today. The one place where we have it wrong is we believe that we earn our salvation by being good people. We say yes to Jesus and, and he sends the Holy Spirit and so we clean up our act with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we become good people and we earn our way to heaven by being good. That's the way our, our, our unregenerated hearts think about faith in Christ. That's the way the world thinks about having a relationship with God. We have to be good people to be worthy for God to take us to heaven. And the gospel doesn't say that at all. The gospel says you will never be a good person apart from Jesus Christ and his spirit living in you. You will never be able to earn your way to salvation so that you can get in God's face and demand, I've been such a good person, God, that you have to take me into eternal life because I earned it. I did it my way. The gospel is the opposite of that. The gospel is a gift we receive from God through our faith in Jesus Christ. It is forgiveness and new life that is planted into us by God through faith in his son. That's what he wants us to experience. That's what he wants us to know. And that is the foundation on which we stand and battle against the wiles of the enemy. We're saved by grace through faith. And so we plant our feet on this foundation and none other. Nothing else will bring peace. Nothing else will cause us to stand firm. When life crashes in, when Satan attacks us, this is the only foundation on which we can stand that will help us to stand against the attack. Jesus talks about this in chapter 7 of Matthew, verses 24 through 27. Jesus says, therefore, if anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Why would the house fall? Because on sand it has no foundation and all the parts of the house move all over the place, loosen up and crash. This foundation is the one foundation that stands firm. This foundation of faith in Jesus Christ and following him with our lives come what may. Dear friends, truth is, if we, were true, if, we were, if we were honest and told the truth, we would have to admit that oftentimes we try to find peace and security in other things besides Jesus. The world seeks peace and security in wealth, in having enough money. The world seeks peace and security in fame, and being a person who's known and, and perhaps respected. The world seeks peace and security in knowledge and having lots and lots of letters after our name of degrees that we have earned that prove how smart we are and how much smarter we are than anybody else. The world tries to find peace and security in power. I'm the one on top. I'm the one who gives orders. No one tells me what to do. I'm the boss. And the truth is, the only foundation that stands firm in, this, in the storms of life is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The foundation of peace with God is found in surrender. The way to peace 
is surrender. The way to total peace is total surrender. And that's the rub. We don't want to surrender. We want to be in control. We want to call the shots. We want to be, if you will, the God of our own lives and sit on the throne and choose what we will do and say to the world and to each other and to ourselves, I did it my way. I get to choose what I do with my life. I'm a free agent. John 14, verse 27 says this. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Not our own control. Not any other foundation. Jesus is our peace. He gives us his peace. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In prayers and petitions with thanksgiving, bring it all to Jesus. Lay it at his feet in surrender, and he will give you peace. That's the way the peace of God that, that is deeper and greater than any human can comprehend. That's the way the peace comes to our lives. It's through surrender. It's through prayer, bringing things to him and saying, I don't have this, God. I don't know how this is going to end, but I trust you, and I know you've got it. I know you've got me. Romans 8, verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. One of the enemy's main accusations against us is, you're not a real Christian. You say you believe in Jesus, but you keep messing up. You keep failing. You keep acting selfishly. You keep hurting your family or your friends or your spouse or your children or your parents or your, or your coworkers. You keep, you keep living like you're not a Christian. You're just a hypocrite. You're not really a Christian or you wouldn't do the things you do, or leave undone the things you leave undone. You might as well tr quit trying to be good because you can never be holy. Satan's accusation. And the truth is, he'd be right if it all depended on me. He'd absolutely be right if it depends on me. But you see, it doesn't depend on me. By faith, by trust, by commitment, Jesus lives in me. Jesus is real. Jesus is not a hypocrite. Jesus has all power and authority. Jesus is holy. And he supplements my lack of those things with his strength, his holiness, his reality, his consistency. And so that's what marks my life instead of my own inconsistency and hypocrisy. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you have a little voice inside your head that constantly accuses you? Look to Jesus. D d don't, don't look at don't listen to what the voice is accusing you of. Look to Jesus. Because Jesus has no condemnation for you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who stand on the foundation of faith in Jesus Christ. It's a war. God's armed us for battle. And dear friends, what I find in my own heart is that I would rather not fight. I, don't, I hate fighting. I don't like conflict. I don't like fighting. I don't like the, the, the displeasure of it. I don't like the, the emotion of it. And I, I try to avoid conflict. How about you? Anybody else here besides me try to avoid conflict? Hello? We don't, we don't want that. And so it, it's not just in our... It's not just in our relationships and in our physical life that we do that, but dear friends, I'm convinced that too many of us Christians are trying to be Swiss.
Christians, Swiss Christians, and here's what I mean by that. Switzerland is famous for remaining neutral in World War II. Switzerland would not fight for or against Germany. They remain neutral. The Swiss have an army. They never use them because neutrality is the position of Switzerland. And we try to play the middle and be neutral so many times. And there's just this little problem. Neutral is lukewarm, and God has a major problem with lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That's God's opinion of neutrality and lukewarmness. Put on the whole armor of God and stand firm. That's what God says. Get a grip. Get a grip on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let Christ grip your heart fully, fully surrendered, holding back nothing, all in, in the shoes of the gospel of peace will be your foundation, and you will not be destroyed. And you will know the peace of Jesus Christ because you will know whatever rages, whatever storm comes, whatever swirls around us, I, I, I just have to keep reminding myself and I remind others frequently, God's got this. But it's more than that. It's not just that God's got this. God's got you. God's got you in the palm of his hand. God's got you in his strong grip. Nothing can destroy you when you are in Christ Jesus. Is your life grounded in the foundation of the gospel? Have you experienced the peace of God that comes from knowing Jesus? If you have, many of us have, if you have, I believe that God's word to his church today is go deeper. Hold back nothing. Surrender everything. Go deeper. Let me work even greater transformation in you than I ever have in the past. Don't hold back. Don't coast. Go deeper. I believe that's God's message to his church. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never asked Jesus to live in your heart, you've never invited him to forgive your sin and give you his grace and be part of your life, I have really good news for you this morning. You don't have to leave here condemned. You don't have to leave here on a slippery foundation of your own works. You don't have to leave here wondering if God loves you. Say yes to Jesus. Invite him in your life. Ask him to forgive your sin. And he will not only do those things, he will not only come in your life and forgive your sin, he will give you peace. Peace with God. Peace in the midst of the storms. Because he holds your life in his strong hand. Will you pray with me? Father, the gospel is simple truth. A child can understand it. Oh, but it's challenging to live. Even when we trust Jesus and even when we ask him to forgive our sins and live in our hearts, we keep wanting to push him off the throne of our lives and sit there and call the shots ourselves. We want to be in control. It's hard to let go. It's hard to stand firm on the foundation of grace through faith. God, would you move us forward? Would you help every person here who already knows Jesus move forward, move deeper into your grace, into the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that our lives are transformed and so the world out there sees Jesus in us. And Father, for those who might be in church today, who have never said yes to Jesus, who have tried to have a relationship with you by being good people. And that's a noble thing. It's a good thing to try, but God, it falls short. We can't do it. 
It is only by the grace of Jesus that we can be redeemed. I just pray that any person here who's never said yes to Jesus, you just draw them to yourself right now so they would have the courage today in this service to ask Jesus to come into their heart, forgive their sin, walk with them in life, change their future. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we pray it in your name. Amen. As we sing the closing song, I'm going to be standing down here. And I just want to invite you, if you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to invite you to come and let's pray and ask Jesus to come in your life and give you this peace that passes all human comprehension. Give you this peace that you can get nowhere else but in Jesus. So if you want to know Jesus and you never said yes to him before, come. We'll pray. We'll ask him in. Please stand, church, and sing with the team.